subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this discussion on Dr. Jawaharlal Dolat Singh's new book, Power Shift: India-China Relations in the Multipolar World. We have Jawaharlal with us. Welcome you, Jawaharlal. We Thank also you. have Anand Krishnan, China correspondent of the Hindu, as this discussant for this afternoon seminar. Welcome, Anand. We have the print as a media partner for this seminar. The event is being uh, live streamed on our YouTube channel, and recording will also be placed on the platforms of our media partner, the print. As you are aware, Dr. Jorav Dolat Singh is a distinguished historian and a strategist. specializing in international relations with a special focus on china and india china relations he is a founder of the north cap university and adjunct fellow with the institute of chinese studies he was previously a fellow with the center for policy research power shift jorawar's fourth book it's a most timely book which seeks to decipher the complex relationship between india and china and how the two countries are coping with each other's rise it has three sections the first section explores the boundary question including the ongoing what the standoff in eastern ladakh the second section looks at the intersection of the india china relations with the rapid and far going changes in the national in international order including the upheavals in the sino us relations the geopolitics of greater eurasia and the indo pacific china's belt and road initiative and brics the third section explores strategic and policy choices and offers well crafted and thoughtful recommendations on the future trajectory of india china relations including on the quest for a new equilibrium as the old paradigm governing the relationship seems to have collapsed it's a much needed book which offers a nuanced view of the multiple drivers and factors shaping the dynamics of the incredibly complicated relationship between india and china proceeding from a policy perspective yet it's it's readable book easy to read easy to digest and definitely well worth a read the analysis up to date as it covers the current crisis in the relationship which is possibly the worst in the post four decades past four over to speak let me explain some ground rules so jorawal will, will speak for about 15 minutes when we'll mute all other participants thereafter he has kindly agreed to take questions anand krishnan and i will have short conversation with jorawar anand will off also offer his comments on the book as a discussant we'll then open the floor for questions you may indicate your interest in asking questions by using the raise hand option available at the bottom of the list of participants questions can also be Sent to me through the chat option. I'll call on participants to ask their questions. The concerned participant will unmute himself or herself. Other participants are requested to keep themselves muted. Before I invite Jorawar to make his remarks, let me also mention that uh, the book is available online and beginning today. In fact, the publishers, the Macmillan, are offering uh, the book on it with a twenty-five percent discount. until 31st december this year uh the coupon code is uh, uh if i remember correctly power shift isn't it jorawar yeah power absolutely shift. so please do avail of this special offer and get your copy of the book uh, i'll now invite jorawar to make his remarks jorawar over to you thank thank you ambassador kanta uh, thank you to ics for hosting this event uh, you've been uh, most generous uh, in supporting uh, work like this uh, also welcome my friend uh, anand krishnan who we were just discussing i met him uh, over a decade ago so he's had uh, absolutely a bird's eye view on 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 the evolution of this relation it would be fantastic to hear his thoughts as well and thank you for everyone else uh, who's tuned in uh let me uh, so in my in my sort of brief remarks i'll try and sort of lay out uh where how this book sort of came about uh uh a bit about how i look at the india china relationship how we even study it and uh a little more perhaps on uh where does this book fit in the overall china policy debate in india today and i might uh 
uh, just to kick start this conversation uh, try and give you uh, my understanding of what is this uh, uh, this new equilibrium that we are trying to seek what is uh, what are the factors that are constraining it or could enable it to happen so uh, the idea behind this book was really prompted uh, by a conversation i had with the former editorial director at pan macmillan uh, prasoon chatterji about 2 years ago i must give credit to him he reached out to me and he actually persuaded me to uh, engage uh, with india's foreign policy and india china relations to a, a wider audience out there he had been sort of following some of my academic work in my uh, previous book that came out which was a deep historical study of india during the cold war he felt it's time to perhaps distill some of uh, those themes to try and make it available to a slightly wider audience who might not necessarily uh, be attracted to uh, the rigor of uh, historical research or jargon international relation jargon so that was really one impetus i think for what made it even more compelling for me was uh, the broader changes that have been occurring in the india china relationship uh, for the past decade uh, we we know the bilateral relationship has seen quite a bit of disruption there's been a heightened state of competition and mistrust interspersed by high level diplomacy during the past 5 6 years uh as as the unipolar world has in a sense been eclipsed by a leveling of the international playing field the ripple effects have been felt at the india china level so this is something that indian governments particularly the modi government has been confronted with this new setting since 2014 uh, uh that same period saw the onset of a new neighborhood regional policy by uh, by china in a series of initiatives that is un, uh, un, unfolded in asia and south asia so so this this change of this that's hence the title power shift there was a broader global power shift from the unipolar world to something that uh, is unrecognizable to at least the the last 30 years of what we had come to be accustomed with this unipolar uh, single power dominated system so uh, and uh, we've seen a series of mini crises in between delhi and beijing as these power shifts are are under are being undertaken and are occurring uh, we've seen also the modus vivendi that was established in uh, 1988 which had sort of held together india china to some sort of an incremental engagement process also being jeopardized in the last uh, several years of course ladakh is sort of the an extreme version of that but uh, i try and sort of lay out uh, how we have been uh, heading towards here and to sort of make sense of of this moment really uh, i also felt coming back to the uh, the impetus for the book for me i felt there there was space in this uh, uh, contested environment of uh, india china relations and as we are seeing uh, quite a lot of policy options being advanced a heated debate happening both in the public square and the media and in academia i felt there was space for a big picture analysis that is historically informative as well as useful to no, for non specialist audiences uh we know that uh, all public policy debates including the china policy debate has been confined to the agenda setting that occurs uh by the specialists in the field so i felt maybe it's time to also reach out to this wider audience that has a deep vested interest in uh where india's foreign policy is going where this relationship is going uh which is going to be a decade long journey multi decade long journey uh the other aspect that influenced my approach to the design of the book was uh the way i have been sort of looking at india china relations i came from a perspective of world order uh from political economy from a broader sort of setting rather than simply uh looking at it from the inside out so that kind of uh and and i when i look back historically i see the india china relationship including the the, the question of the territorial dispute never really being a bilateral issue or a single issue subject it was always entangled with questions of where india and china will fit in in the asian uh, world order where will uh, how how will regional geopolitics shape uh, these issues so there was this sense of a larger puzzle out there and that's the way i've thematically sort of laid out the book where my three themes uh, territory world order regional geopolitics Uh, are in a sense always interlinked and entangled with each other uh so so to give you an example uh when we look at fashioning a compromise on the seven decade long border dispute 
for me it's impossible for that to even happen without a common understanding of uh, between india and china on asia's future and their place in it or for example for india and china to unlock meaningful economic cooperation uh, it's it's extremely difficult without having some geopolitical predictability in their ties so so uh, the way we typically tend to i'm not talking of the specialists but there is a tendency to sort of break this up in silos and uh, and deal with these separate parts of the india china equation i think that's becoming harder and harder and, and uh, i i laid out right from the 50s it was never really the case there it was always a complex picture which was entangled uh let me uh, briefly sort of uh, set this book where it sort of fits in the china policy debate so we've had uh, a range of uh, policy perspectives out there which are being advanced by different uh, uh sort of uh, which presume different uh preferences for world order and a uh, different places for india in that order so for me my central theme of this book which i uh, it's which is a running theme really is that real politic engagement and managing this period of competition is the most realistic and prudent policy option for india uh for me some of the alternatives being propagated uh typically uh, are unconvincing and unsustainable and let me explain why so one common sort of policy option that's placed out there this idea that uh, india can participate in an allied security framework built on a common china threat i think to me uh, the way we see uh, the current uh, 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 sort of politics of of asia south asia and the world that doesn't seem viable for two reasons one uh the range of challenges that china poses and is likely to present to its various neighbors and the major powers like the us are all different and occur in distinct uh, geographies and geostrategic settings so coordinating a nato style strategy that was undertaken during the first cold war where you have one single superpower that mobilizes uh, uh follower states into dealing uh with a common threat perception is simply not possible because there will always be disagreement uh on uh the security priorities among this group today uh the second uh uh, uh sort of uh, alternative that's been put put aside out there is that okay if security alliances are not possible is there a normative framework that can be built in ideological alliance so to speak where india teams up with other democracies and some sort of a coalition of the free to sort of uh, hem in china to follow the rules of the game uh, this seems intuitive uh, the the case has been made in the west and uh, by some in india again i find this uh, a proposition that isn't easy to operationalize uh, uh, the reason i say this is that india's own identity uh, is and always has been an amalgam of several facets particularly its civilizational tradition of uh, uh, pluralism and inclusiveness uh it's its geopolitical independence and a sense of manifest destiny as a as a future great power uh it, india also does not possess a proselytizing tradition uh whereby using democracy is something that it uh, seeks to sort of project and propagate and advance externally so uh and and i i think I, the the fundamental uh sort of flaw in this approach would be that using democracy might just vacate uh the space the large space in the global south to uh, to china to advance its influence because after all it was precisely this identity that you could play out there that it was not just democracy but you were open to a multitude of regimes who had their own uh, complicated histories their own uh, uh, colonial sort of experiences and they simply were not willing to just accept a single sort of uh, identity that's laid out by let's say the western alliance so to speak so so if we are dealing with a more complex uh, multipolar world uh, an ideological sort of countervailing coalition uh, is is not something that will be easy to sort of uh, build and, uh, and 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 enable india to sort of project its influence uh let me spend like now my closing remarks on uh, on this idea of an india china equilibrium i think that's the sort of the closing theme in my book uh, i'm of course responding to the uh the challenge of recent years it's been expressed by uh india's foreign minister as well that uh, uh dealing and creating a new equilibrium is something that is on the minds of indian policy makers uh 
there's also been this debate over the last decade or certainly the last four or five years that the 1988 Morris Vivendi is is not uh, holding up to to uh, the sort of the aims and ends that it is set out to. And those ends were peace and tranquility, a stable frontier, uh, allowing India and China to cooperate on other grounds and find some progress on their seven decade old dispute. I think on all three fronts, we're seeing sort of uh, uh, more or less uh, the house of cards really uh, crumbling and it's being just held together by these uh, leadership summits that are happening and just uh, just about keeping the game going. But uh, I think there needs to be a more durable set of uh, norms that both Indian and Chinese leaders now need to uh, accept and internalize for them to uh, go ahead on their relationship. So I, I believe just conflict avoidance, avoidance of major war is not by itself a, 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 an impetus for India and China to take their relationship forward. There has to be something more. Uh, now, having said that, uh, uh, what uh, I feel there are three reasons, uh, and this again enters through the course of the book, uh, three reasons why negotiating this new Morris Vivendi is something that is uh, becoming uh, difficult or it's simply not even taking off. So the first reason, something which uh, many of us are familiar with today is the growing power asymmetry between India and China. Uh, when uh, the Xi Jinping regime came in uh, in 2012, uh, and if you look at the last decade, uh, rather than a narrowing of differences, material differences, and uh, on all metrics of nas comprehensive national power, we're actually seeing a widening between China and India. Uh, so that certainly has, uh, in, uh, when uh, I'm looking at the incentives on both sides, particularly from the Chinese, it has lowered their incentive to, to find some sort of uh, an accommodation or concessions on their side. For in India's dilemma is quite understandable, unable to sort of lower or reduce its asymmetry with China. We have engaged in a quite an ambitious uh, geo strategy of deepening uh, ties very proactively with China's neighbors, with the major powers, in order to sort of compensate for this uh, national uh, asymmetry with China. It hasn't succeeded. I think that's a reality uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, primarily because ultimately the sinews of uh, power that we're talking about are and must remain a domestic endeavor for India. So, so I think until we have found some sol policy solution uh, for the power gap, it seems difficult for India and China to reach at least a sustainable modus vivendi, the one that we seek, which is uh, uh, this emergence of a, a peer status or at least a, a level which is commensurate with India's ambitions and civilizational aspiration. The second uh, a uh, factor that is obstructing or complicating a, some sort of a geopolitical understanding or even a settlement of their border dispute is this idea of geopolitical in, uh, intentions uh, and the uncertainty and fluidity that these intentions have uh, typically had. Uh, so if historically we see uh, uh, right from the 50s, we've seen uh, there's always been this basic sense of uncertainty from China, but also from India on what will be their relationship after the resolution of the territorial dispute and, and the end of uh, India's involvement on the Tibet issue. Uh, this sense of unease and lack of confidence in the other side's future roles and security policies have led to a hedging policy where there's an innate reluctance to reach an accommodation or a uh, geopolitical understanding. If you look at what Chinese strategists and scholars are saying, uh, even recently, there's an unwillingness to make a bet on what will be India's future foreign policy. If anything, uh, the dominant belief among the Chinese seems to be that India has already chosen the other side or has crossed a tipping point. Whether that's true or not, that's the belief out there. Uh, I, and I would, I would uh, submit that even in India, there seems to be a conservatism and risk aversion shaping Indian thinking in terms of let's not make concessions before we're quite sure of where China is heading and what will be its uh, the nature of its rise after a decade. So there's this uh, mismatch of geopolitical intentions and which uh, are not allowing both sides to come to some sort of a, a, a common understanding of how they will deal with each other. So what are we left with really? Because these are, these are unresolvable in the short term, so to speak, or the medium term. So we're really left with the overall world order geopolitical context that... Uh, historically and continues to either play a role, disruptive role, 
for India-China relations or a role that can stabilize the relationship. So, uh, in this book, in the book, I've highlighted uh, uh, the enormous significance that changing geopolitical contexts have had on India-China relations. Uh, in fact, I go as far as to assert that all the phases of detente and rapprochement, as well as heightened tension and conflict, would not have ensued had the geopolitical setting not unfolded in the fashion that it did from each decade since the 1950s. So for every decade since the 1950s, the context, uh, the major power setting has shaped uh, the calculus in Beijing, but also in India. So, uh, and this has also been now uh, reflected uh, by other strategists elsewhere. I think, I think for, for the Chinese, certainly uh, there's a larger world order puzzle that's constantly animating and dominating the way they are shaping their India policy. And uh, I, I suppose the goal really is, can we make it more bilateral in a sense? Can we deal or come to this understanding that we are important for each other? That is India is important for China and China for India, regardless of the fluidity and the flux and the ebbs and flows that are happening in Asia, South Asia and the world. So I think that's the policy challenge. And uh, we, 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 we have to find some sort of a framework that can take us there. Uh, I'll, I'll close now, uh, Ambassador Kanta, and uh, hand it back to you. You're on mute. Am I audible now? Yes. Thank you, Jarawar, for so lucidly unpacking the main thrust of your book, uh, explaining why you wrote in the first place and how the book was written. Uh, those remarks are very valuable. Uh, I'll now use the, my prerogative as the chair and pose the two, three questions to you. So let me begin with uh, something which is uh, bothering you know, all of us at this point of time. Uh, we are today in the midst of a major crisis in India-China relations. In your book, you have argued that the clues to understanding this, what you call tailspin in relations, will not be found in isolated developments in the border areas. Rather, the main reason has been a systematic buildup of negative images of each other, of how each side views the other's foreign policy, along with a collapse in geopolitical trust. Can you elaborate on this argument and also share with us your assessment of the nature of the current crisis in the relationship? Thank you. Yes. So this, uh, let me uh, preface uh, the response by saying that the the, the 1988 understanding between India and China had, uh, at, at its core, had sort of uh, taken away this idea that we're going to seek relative gains from our relationship and deal with our differences in, in, on, a, on, on each tactical sort of point and try to seek that advantage. So all these CDMs that we saw in the 1990s, where in a sense you called a truce and uh, you, you sort of more or less froze the status quo even though it is undefined, there were a lot of gray zones. You you sort of uh, you called you called sort of a stalemate in a sense that we can't deal with our dispute, we can't solve it. We got to have a political process, and in the meanwhile, we're going to open up these new channels of engagement. I think where the uh, the changes have happened, in, I wouldn't uh, trace them entirely to uh, the in Indian side or China's India policy. I think China's uh, own broader foreign policy changes after the global economic crisis and then after uh, the new regime comes in in uh, 2012, combined with how U.S. foreign policy is evolving in Asia. I think you, you're getting a sense where the Chinese themselves have taken upon the belief that the power shift was happening, obviously, even before this time period. But now it's time to sort of act upon some of these changes and try and raise and elevate your status. I think we're all familiar with the idea of the, the Deng Xiaoping dictum sort of being set aside in favor of being a little more proactive, a little more uh, engaged in order building, take on the responsibilities of a great power, which means reorienting your periphery. Uh, this has brought China into friction with those powers on its periphery that have their own geopolitical visions, their own aspirations for spheres of influence or special zones uh, which, which is, so there is this structural sort of competition that has come in as China has sort of laid claim to what it believes is a status commensurate with its material power. 
uh, where India has uh, 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 that that uh, coming to this point of the border crisis. I think where uh, uh, you we are seeing uh, the change after two thousand thirteen is that both sides have now abandoned what they had led the SRs to do. That we will not engage in tactical maneuvering and trying to sort of uh, extract advantages on the grey zones. And and now you've left the militaries to try and sort of uh, gain advantage over the others. So those are the crises that have been sort of spiraling out. And Ladakh certainly, if you take the the Indian government's own official uh, rhetoric, that uh, there is a sense of a mystery behind it. There's a puzzle behind it. I think that's something that needs to be unpacked. That what are Chinese motivations out there? My own understanding is that the Chinese have simply uh, sort of uh, partly given up on. Uh, on where they see the India-China relationship going, and once you sort of lower that in your calculus, you start extracting advantages. You start trying to make uh, because you still hold this uh, uh, a power asymmetry over India. So why not use it to your advantage to try and resettle the frontier? And maybe that's an erroneous calculus from their point of view because it has completely upended the dominant belief in India that. We we need to sort of engage with China in the old framework, so it's actually hardened positions as well. So, so it's 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 a partly structural competition. It's partly uh, China unwilling to change its overall South Asia policy. Um, uh, from from the Indian point of view, really uh, you you you're left with a quite a difficult problem. You've got to hold the front. You've got to prevent the status quo from deteriorating to a point where you can't salvage that. You've got to uh, at the same time avoid major war. So, what the space for negotiating a new modus vivendi on the border itself is a quite a complicated endeavor. I think uh, what I'm also suggesting is that let's at the same time not adopt uh, a a policy that uh, uh, reduces your flexibility to find uh, uh, sort of slightly more uh, complex solutions later on, and that I'm partly advancing. Maybe I'm going beyond your question in a sense, but I'm partly advancing that uh, because we are likely to see changes from uh, U.S.-China uh, relations in 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 perhaps uh, when the new administration comes in. So there will be possibilities to for us to also readapt and maybe for the Chinese to also start rethinking some of their regional policies as well. Thanks, thanks. Uh, let me let me. Shift to another area that is uh, something you have referred to in your in your opening remarks. Uh, you know the basic paradigm which has governed India-China relations since late 1980s, especially you know uh, following Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's visit to China in December 1988. Uh, it involved you know among other things compartmentalizing the boundary question and other outstanding issues and seeking development to relations in other areas. Uh, uh you seem to suggest that you know this paradigm has broken down and there's need for new equilibrium in the relationship specifically i wanted you to comment on whether the border issue is back as a central concern without addressing which the meaning in a meaningful manner it would be difficult to keep the relationship in even keel i think this is also a major point of divergence today between positions of india and china Chinese would like us to manage our differences on border question, uh, whereas India is insisting that there must be restoration of peace and tranquility in border areas before we can return to our relations being on a more normal keel. What are your views on that? Thank you. Yeah. So, so one point, a uh, one uh, set of norms that came out of 1988. I think those still remain valid. The idea that. You need to have a stable and peaceful frontier, which is basically peace between two states for any other forward development. I think that foundation cannot be sort of compromised with naturally. So uh, I think in the Indian side is absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, frankly, uh, uh, it, it's a it's a no brainer in a sense that you've got to maintain that position where without peace and tranquility, you can't have any normal relationship with China going forward. Uh, having said that, coming back to this idea of a new equilibrium, the the modus vivendi that India and China crafted, I think we often forget, was quite different to let's say some of the major power accommodations that were out there. So I mean, give you the example of let's say Russia and China. 
when the uh, the, the uh, their rapprochement process also began around the same time in the mid 80s and it eventually led to them solving their territorial dispute in 2004 everything was settled at least on their frontiers which we've seen has allowed them to sort of engage in far more productive strategic engagement economic engagement uh, on a host of other areas so that's where uh, i think this idea of the border holding back cooperation now of course it's not just a political dispute that's being can't be settled politically i think now you're seeing militaries actively trying to change the status quo because they've given up on a political solution so they're just trying to just create a new line which in their minds in this case the chinese minds somehow is a belief that that new line is something that they can live with for a prolonged period of time uh i don't know if that answers your question of uh, what should be uh, india's position uh, on this crisis but certainly i would uh, continue and i think the indian government has has put this position that peace and tranquility is the basis for any normal india china relationship i think that framework has to stay thanks issue which you have covered in your book uh, you have explored the engagement in india and china in the overlapping periphery and suggested a limited geopolitical accommodation between the two countries uh, my question is uh, do you think it's really possible to have such an accommodation in the midst of the ongoing reset in the relationship and the utter lack of geopolitical trust between india and china mm -hmm. so when i'm talking of a limited geopolitical accommodation or at least trying to come at some understanding of what should be china's role in asia is something that which can be acceptable to the indian side so so i'm proceeding from the premise that china south asia policy is already now in play uh, china has already built up a level of engagement in the neighborhood and there's no really sort of reversing that so now uh, where are the areas that you can find a relationship with china and your neighbors that you are willing to live with so i think these these are choices or sort of red lines that you have to make there is uh, what kind of relationship between china and bangladesh is something that you can work with and and where do you draw the line so i think that's where so it's it's comes down to really where do you exercise your veto to the extent that you can and also uh, my the the other argument that i'm trying to bring out is is other areas of china south asia economic cooperation uh i mean if you look back at before the crisis period of these 2 3 4 years i think there was a sense of there were certain parts of china's economic engagement in certain areas or certain connectivity areas let's say in the northeast and others which possibly could have been uh dovetailed with what india was trying to connect with into asean and others so i'm trying to sort of keep open that possibility i know it's in the current framework or the current uh setting of mistrust and the ladakh crisis is not possible to pick those up but i wouldn't sort of create this blanket uh uh sort of policy that we aren't going to accept any chinese engagement in the region because your neighbors are not going along with you on that so i i i feel if you are going to have some sort of a regional response to the chinese you're going to have to feed into or at least listen to what your neighbors are saying out there your neighbors are seeking a little more development options to the extent that they can get from beyond india which as we know given our limited uh, uh, budgetary constraint state capacity does not allow us to fulfill all those requirements so if you could have other players out there coming in i mean one of the ways we have tried to sort of uh, approach this is invite other major powers like japan as well to feed into some of the developmental uh, aspirations of our neighbors so that's happening which is positive but i don't think india's neighbors have completely going to seal off the chinese so is there a space for india to shape that engagement rather than just sort of strike a a position of we aren't going to accept any real chinese investments and connectivity projects in the neighborhood i'm of course ruling out areas that are completely like sort of vital to indian security interests or sovereignty like for example the cpec i'm saying put those aside are there other areas that you should be trying to shape and and are, which are the other economic actors within india that you should be bringing onto the table uh, what what are the complex forms of interdependence that you want to build what's the type of relationship that south asia should have with east asia as well after all 
we are the least integrated with this broader east asian political economy that's been built up over the last 40 years so can india lead that way because if you do not you're going to see china sort of uh, pulling each of these states into its orbit and and you're going to struggle to sort of uh, enter that uh, that new political economy networks that are growing so i'm saying try to try to make the best of this material asymmetry because you have the geopolitical weight today to shape how neighbors our neighbors which are also china's neighbors uh, will deal with china's rise because they still have a deference and respect for indian power today thanks i, I have one more question for you zorabar uh, yes. uh, you know in your book uh, you have explored uh, uh, my question is whether china is really serious about multipolarity or it is merely paying lip service to the idea of multipolarity while it pursues the goal of regional and eventually global preeminence given the huge and growing gap between the economic military and strategic capabilities of india and china is china prepared to consider india as a significant pole in a multipolar world or is it seeking a hierarchical order with itself as the dominant player so the short answer is uh, it isn't at this stage willing to accept india as a pole i think that's precisely where the crisis has emerged india wants to become a future pole it wants to become a pillar of the next asian order and there's a mismatch of roles and uh, where the problem i see arising is of course uh, chinese accepting this india but i think india not having the power to give expression to its ambitions i think that's where the power gap is uh, having a crisis on india's foreign policy so while we must and are engaging in a quite a sophisticated sort of geo strategy of of developing a uh, uh, deep strategic ties with china's neighbors we're doing that we've been doing that for a while now uh, right from southeast asia vietnam japan you look at the quad you look at the united states you look at even the deep engagement with russia as well you're seeing the their eastern pivot uh, the the links with vladivostok so you you are imagining a eurasian asian architecture that is multipolar uh, on your point of whether the chinese want it or not i think the way power has distributed already and the identities the way they are placed in eurasia and asia i don't think other countries on china's periphery are uh, any more eager for a chinese hegemony or a hierarchical system to come into place uh, so in that sense there will always be a natural uh, countervailing sort of uh, i won't call it a coalition but there will be a countervailing pushback to this image of world order if that truly exists in the chinese mind and they start giving expression to it because you they've got 14 neighbors out of that at least half a dozen have quite proud national identities and history so they are not going to uh, let that happen if they have a choice so so while india is uh, is in a weak position materially uh, in terms of its bilateral asymmetry there is generally a belief out there that Uh, let's put it this way i think uh, most player most states in asia and eurasia have priced in multipolarity in their foreign policy that's how they are operating that's how they are dealing with other states that's how they're dealing with the major powers so a lot has to do with how you are already anticipating and projecting the international order so uh, the chinese will have to uh, 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 listen to those uh, voices which are which are not insignificant thanks thanks uh, let me now you know invite our discussant uh, uh, mr anand krishnan china correspondent of the hindu anand has an outstanding track record reporting from china for nearly a decade for the hindu in india today he has recently published an excellent book india's china challenge which we had discussed at this forum a few weeks ago anand over to you thanks so much uh, ambassador kant and thank you uh, for having me today Um, I should begin by congratulating Zarawar. Um, I think it's really a timely book and easy to read, as Ambassador Kanta said. And I think that uh, the strength of it lies in the fact that I think it really will appeal to a lot of people, whether it's students or journalists covering the China story. I think it is really timely, especially when we seem to be confronting this huge change in the relationship, and all of us trying to make sense of it uh, this year. and i think that when we are in the middle of these events sometimes 
things perhaps uh, feel more momentous than it than they turn out to be. Uh, and I think that while we are wondering if 2020 may be as big a turning point in the relationship, uh, if, whether it's similar to 88 or even 62, I think sometimes we forget the long view. And I think what uh, power shift does very well is give us this long view. Um, we've been, I think Ambassador Kant and Zorawar have been discussing the future of this post-88 model. Uh, and I think that there seems to be a consensus in India, at least in the press, from everything that you read, that uh, it isn't working anymore. Uh, and I think there are some people who, I think, as it were, want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But I think that this book gives us a measured appraisal of what has worked in terms of engagement, what hasn't worked. And I think why some of the knee-jerk responses that tend to dominate our conversations today sometimes don't really stand up very well when you take the long view. I think he describes a relationship that we should aspire to very aptly using this phrase where he says, uh, we need a sustained relationship of competitive but peaceful coexistence, which I thought really sums up very well where the relationship seems to be heading. I thought I would just quickly flag five takeaways that I had. And uh, since Ambassador Kant allowed pose a couple of questions to Zarawar before uh, we open it up to the audience. I think the first uh, most important takeaway for me was when it comes to balance of power, the impact of global geopolitics and shaping the bilateral dynamic. I think it doesn't get as much attention as it should. Uh, I think the book is, has a lot of insights on the origins of the boundary question, the slide of the relationship in the late 1950s. And it's insightful because of this prism of balance of power calculations and global geopolitics and how it impacted decision making both in India and in China. Uh, he makes the case that there was growing confidence in India that global balance of power was tilting in its favor. This became a general belief in Delhi by the second half of the 50s. Uh, he says that Nehru's balance of power approach was focused less on pursuing a structured conversation with great powers on China, but more on publicly signaling that India had powerful friends, that India had more powerful friends than China did. There was one great quote uh, where uh, he quotes Nehru as saying in 1959 that in the unfortunate event of a war, such a thing will not remain an isolated, limited affair and the world will be dragged into it. So such was the perception at the time. Uh, there's another great uh, quote that stayed with me, which was when Foreign Secretary MJ Desai told the US ambassador that there would not be any extensive Chinese reaction to the forward policy. This was on October 13th, 1962 because of the fact that they were afraid of the US, which I thought was, a, was a quite a striking observation as well. Uh, the second point that I think that has a lot of relevance to us today is the limits of balancing. I think this lens that uh, is used throughout the book, uh, I found it pretty insightful when you look at the relationship in the 70s and 80s, because that seems to be a period that kind of falls out of our attention. We look at 1947 to 62, then we look at post 88. Uh, but I thought that it was quite interesting to look at how starting in the late 1970s, the push to fix the relationship began uh, with Deng Xiaoping. Uh, the fact that there was a changing world situation at that time as well, when the US and China had mended ties and were looking to pull India away from the Soviet Union. So I thought this was a very useful lens for us to think about recent uh, developments as well. Uh, when we tend to think this growing US-China rivalry gives us a somewhat favorable external environment. But I think there is a cautionary note as well in terms of the limits to how much India can gain from trying to exploit that, starting with the fact that China isn't as isolated today as it was back then. The third point that I want to flag is the domestic politics of, of China as a driver in the relationship. I think that uh, the book does a good job in bringing out domestic drivers in the early 1960s. Uh, it reminds us uh, of the background to Joan Lai's uh, visit of 1960, at a time when China was looking to diffuse tensions against, its own, against the backdrop of its own problems with the Soviet Union. By 1961, Mao is, of course, under pressure with the Great Leap Forward. And I think he makes a great point that India wasn't their biggest problem then. Uh, there were threats from Taiwan. They were worried about American involvement in Vietnam. There were problems on the China-Soviet Union border. And then ultimately, it was a political struggle uh, that led Mao in August 62 
to ditch this pragmatic approach over the last two years and this radical turn that we saw both domestically and in terms of China's foreign policy as well. And I think to us, it is a warning uh, all these years on in trying to pay more attention to how domestic changes in China can affect its behavior externally. We obviously missed those signs in 1962. One area where I think the book could have had more detail was in teasing out how China today is looking at the relationship and the new equilibrium, which uh, we've all been discussing and which he says in the book, both countries are striving for. I think the book excellently presents the Indian perspective uh, and Indian concerns, and it does delve into Chinese pers perspectives in parts. But I think sometimes we can make assumptions that we that they are seeking broadly what we want, which is putting it very simply a new uh, modus vivendi, and we can find a way to live with differences without descending into hostilities. Uh, this may well be true, but I think as the book reminds us too, we should be careful about assumptions about shared objectives, which can turn out to be disastrously wrong, as our history tells us. And I think this has become all the more salient under Xi Jinping when making sense of what's happening in China domestically, I think unfortunately has become as difficult as it was 60 years ago. Uh, the other point that I wanted to flag uh, was in terms of the role of the political leadership in India and China and managing the relationship and in managing the boundary question. Uh, I think uh, the book does speak about the current crisis in Ladakh and I think it makes a very valid point that without meaningful political dialogue, you can't really outsource this problem to the militaries to settle, which is from, as, as I can see, that's what seems to be happening right now. Um, I think he makes a very good point that the general structural dynamics do incentivize both militaries to push up to as much as they can. Uh, when you leave border management at the military level, generally, I think I agree with him when he says it isn't conducive to peace and tranquility when military institutions, by definition, are inclined to pursue security. And it's not, uh, and you can't sort of leave the entire problem of conflict resolution to them. And to me, it's been striking that the, the limited amount of high level political intervention that we've seen since May 2020, uh, which is something that I think the book is very sort of ahead of its, uh, ahead of the crisis in predicting. Lastly, a point on the benefits of engagement, which uh, we've been discussing today as well. I think he makes a good argument that only when two conditions were, able, were met was India able to shape a cooperative posture from China, which is firstly leveraging the international environment and secondly maintaining a policy of engagement. He argues, citing various examples in history, that when the second leg was not handled, it increased anxiety and threat perceptions on the other side. And ultimately, it led to outcomes where both sides were worse off. It's hard to disagree with him when he makes a case for an approach to China that is less driven by sentiment about China and more about what we want from the relationship with China. I think, unfortunately, that doesn't often seem to be the case. And I think that some of that is reflected in the handling of the current crisis as well. Uh, very briefly on, on the boundary settlement, I completely endorse his view that I think that we are in dire need of, of a domestic political debate and conversation about the merits of pursuing a settlement, the costs of a settlement, and the costs of not settling. I think that I agree with him that we have never had a serious domestic conversation on the contours of what a settlement would look like when the mainstream narrative is pretty much that either it's a maximalist settlement where India gains everything or forget about it, there's no point in negotiating. That's, that's the general predominant view you see reflected in the media as well. And I think that when it's clear to anyone that it's impossible to recover territories lost unless through war, somehow this illusion has been sustained, I think, which various political leaderships, not just this current government have reinforced, saying that we will die to get back our lands, whatever be the cost. The result of the sustained illusion is that it's impossible to have any meaningful debate, I think, on a boundary resolution. And I think he has made a great attempt to start that conversation. Uh, in short, I found it to be extremely insightful, uh, especially because of situating the current bilateral dynamics against a global context, starting from the 50s through the 70s and to now. 
Um, I don't want to eat up too much of your time, but if I could pose a couple of questions, Ambassador Kanta. Sure. Starting with the current crisis, uh, Zorawar, I want you to sort of elaborate on what you spoke about more broadly in terms of the role of a political leadership uh, in addressing these issues and why you make the case that this can't be left to military level dialogues or even conference building mechanisms that we have in place. You need political interventions for such crises. So what's been, in light of that argument, I'd like you to just speak a little bit about how you have seen India handling this current crisis from the political perspective. Thank you, Anand. That was a quite a comprehensive uh, overall summary. I learned, I seriously learned a lot. Thank you. So uh, I, I think that point you uh, made, I think we discussed this earlier as well. I think the, the, when I look back, this idea of the special representatives, that there will be a political track, which is actually going to keep moving towards the center. I think from 2012, 2013, from what we can see available in the public domain really is that that process reached a saturation point where we are told both sides had come to at least some sort of an understanding of what is the precise areas of dispute that are left in, in all these sectors and what are the possible contours of where they could go ahead. And then after that, you see sort of things just completely uh, uh, flattening out, not really taking forward. And then you see the border management process, uh, this tit for tat infrastructure build up, uh, a, uh, military tactical initiatives. Uh, so, so these two pillars where political settlement process used to keep a sense of predictability that you guys, you know, the militaries don't need to go out and secure these minute gray zones that are still left, right? I mean, ultimately, if you look at the bigger picture of the three and a, three and a half thousand kilometer frontier, you've got more or less everything on the eastern side. Uh, the room for ambiguity is very less from what we are told. The the gray zones really are now in this sector of uh, Aksai Jin Ladakh, really. And if you look at the the data that uh, the Indian side, I mean, it's coming out through the media from the military of the transgressions that we call them, both sides, uh, almost overwhelming percentage is happening in this Western sector. So we know that now this trend where if the political resolution side has taken a back foot. So here I would, okay, maybe introspect a little bit on the Indian side that if you proceed with the assumption that you hold a weaker hand with China, right? Then wouldn't you want CBMs? Wouldn't you want the political track to be, give you that extra comfort room to allow you to sort of stabilize the frontier? So I think when, uh, and I'm not, I don't know why this process of SRs stopped or why it wasn't picked up to the extent that it was there, but you just left open uh, the asymmetry at the operational level to just take a life of its own, really. So that was the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, regarding this particular crisis, has it been dealt with? Yeah, it's it's actually interesting. I think you're possibly referring to the, uh, the fact that political statements at the highest level came quite late in the day, so to speak. And, and even the level of engagement that the Indian leadership is having with the Chinese has been very, very... Uh, constricted in a sense. Uh, uh, it's so, so there is certainly uh, something we, which we don't know if it's happening in back channels, but the idea that uh, um, I, I would possibly trace it to this, again, a belief in both sides that we are, we are uh, both have, have taken on these positions that this is questions of sovereignty, uh, uh, sort of a self entitlement that we are not going to reach out to the other side because these are questions of on national honor and territory. So this is it, it's, it was quite a dangerous situation. I mean, now we're reaching the literally uh, the winter setting and those areas have sort of become uh, uninhabitable in a sense. But there was a time when this crisis was really had taken on a, a, a level where it could have escalated, for example. So, so in that situation, maybe your question of where was the political leadership? I mean, it had was it only going to leave it to military commanders or where was the, where was the high level uh, political diplomacy uh, in this? Anand, do you have another question? Okay, then, then we move on to, to questions from the floor. Uh, we have 
uh, several pe people who have uh, shown interest in asking question. Uh, we'll start with Professor Professor S T Muni, then uh, move on to Sanjay Baru and Ravi Bhutlingam. Uh, Professor Muni, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Well, I am a bit puzzled about this equilibrium uh, aspect because Foreign Minister has very assertively talked about it. Now, uh, Anant is absolutely right that unless uh, we engage with them on issues of critical domestic significance to them, uh, what what fun the Chinese would see in engaging with us or or helping us uh, reach an equilibrium particularly because in their assessment, they know the asymmetry, which I think Zurawar has very rightly underlined, uh, is, 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 is a very stark uh, fact. And uh, they, they don't want to ignore it in, in their engagement with, with India. Now, the critical issues which are important from the Chinese point of view to engage with India and uh, link to domestic politics, as Anant has very rightly said, are the BRI, Tibet, uh, alliance with the U.S. and economic relations. And on all these four issues, I don't see the present leadership in India can make any significant compromises uh, without paying heavy political cost. Now, under these circumstances, what is it which you think uh, is, is possible and, and where this uh, slogan of equilibrium really exists on, on the ground? Thank you. I think, uh, Professor Muni, you laid it out uh, in a in a quite a stark fashion. The incentives uh, uh, or or the ideas where the give that the Chinese seek from India uh, are on on such core issues for them. Uh, what are, what are the reciprocal advantages that India seeks for itself? So maybe some of the issues out there is uh, uh, the Sino-Pakistan relationship is one. Uh, getting back to some sort of a framework on the border that at least allows for uh, uh, stability and, and avoids this unnecessary uh, military sort of posturing that could last literally now every summer season lasting up to six, seven months. That's two. Uh, the other thing we would possibly want some sort of a understanding is what is the type of uh, South Asia regional policy, the economic engagement that the Chinese are seeking uh, and can we have a say in that? So uh, these are the three or four. And of course, if you want big picture ideas, you can go into uh, what are the level of multilateral collaborative areas? Can you uh, gain better access and status and rulemaking powers in these new institutions that possibly the Chinese are going to keep co-creating with others or investing in in the future? So if you look at the overall picture of uh, or menu of options, there are certainly areas that you can bring forward as well to get uh, similar concessions of the Chinese. But of course, there is a sense that they don't, they, they aren't maybe as vital to the Chinese as what they are seeking from you. So they certainly, as you rightly point out, there's a mismatch of what you're seeking from each other, which then we go back to that old cycle of what is this equilibrium really about? Is it about just uh, the idea of let there be a tentative stability, no war, no peace kind of situation? Uh, what happens to all those uh, forms of cooperation, albeit modest, that had sort of built up in the last 20 years. Are you going to roll those back? Are you going to just toss them out? Because after all, the Indian economy today uh, and their various, and even these multilateral institutions like the AIIB, the BRICS, the SA, there's, there's a whole range of uh, areas that now you are interdependent in some ways. We can argue about how significant they are, but there are areas now that you are already entangled with each other. What happens to those? So. So uh, I, I think before an equilibrium, maybe both sides need to come to some sort of an understanding. Is that 1988 modus vivendi, which was by itself, frankly, very, very modest. It had no promises on conflict resolution. It had no promises on anything except that there will be a measure of peace and stability on their frontier. And everything else can sort of take on a life of its own if it's mutually acceptable and beneficial. So, so I think that that framework, the foundation must stay. And uh, once you have restored a status quo on the frontier and stability on the frontier that you are willing to live with, then you can uh, go back to sort of uh, building up on these areas. But 
if we're going to give uh, the argument that until I have parity with the Chinese, I'm not going to be able to have a stable, beneficial relationship with them. I mean, that could be possibly self-delusional here because we, that could be a period of several decades where you will reach that level of material uh, wherewithal to be able to extract that kind of uh, 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 status that you're seeking from them and, and adjustments in their policy. So you're going to have to go along in this way that uh, the, the, the mantra that I put across or that uh, tip, uh, the nomenclature where you can have peaceful coexistence. There will be competition, but it does not have to be a violent coexistence or a confrontation like this ideological struggle that we saw in the Cold War. That was just one aberration of a template of two systems colliding. I don't see that happening here. There's no identity clash. There's no sort of world order struggle uh, in a sense. Uh, so there, there, there's room to sort of uh, keep this competition, manage it at a level that allows you to focus on your multitude of domestic modernization tasks, social stability, uh, restoring the region, engaging in the types of roles that you want to do to safeguard globalization, the multipolar world. So if you look at Indian foreign policy from the largest canvas, I think the case for having a stable India-China relationship from our own selfish national interests is, is something that we must accept. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, Anand couldn't ask his second question earlier as he was muted. Can you ask your question now, Anand? Sure, thank you. I just had one more question, Zoroar. Um, in terms of some of the measures we've taken economically uh, this year, uh, whether it was the ban on the apps or curbs uh, to more strictly regulate investment from China, I was just uh, curious to get your sense on that. Uh, do you think it's understandable for us to want to convey this message that there can't be business as usual? Or uh, do you see uh, another argument for something which... China and Japan have done, I think you mentioned in your book as well, uh, where you choose investments from China that you think would be in your interest rather than uh, approach it in terms of a blanket policy. I was just curious as to how you mm -hmm. made our economic response. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that's the other big debate that we are happening, uh, which is happening today in India. So naturally, at the peak of the crisis, it was quite natural to bring out some sort of sanctions on Chinese economic interests or access in India, right? That's only natural when you're reaching the possibility of armed confrontation. Uh, I'll, I'll broaden that up by saying that I think if you look back at the earliest part of this year, I think there was a broader economic shift that was happening in India that preceded this crisis. I think there was a belief uh, in, in, in the Indian policymaking apparatus that we now need to reset the type of really economic ties or engagement that we're going to have with China it was partly linked to, of course, this idea that we're going to uh, rejuvenate Indian industry. Uh, we're going to have to uh, relook at some of these trade packs that are coming in across Asia. So there was this broader uh, sort of shift that was being contemplated. Partly it was uh, somewhat inspired by uh, the Trump administration as well, which was also trying to restore its own uh, national economic well-being at home after globalization had sort of frittered away uh, industry or weakened uh, its uh, uh, its uh, domestic capabilities. So we were trying to draw from that and do our own uh, uh, China policy. Of course, the parallels are a little different. Uh, I, I, there's, there's some interesting research out there. I think this idea that uh, what a role does economic interdependence play in shaping geopolitics between states and how does it shape their calculus? So, so I think what we're seeing is that this idea that the, 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 the old sort of framework was economic interdependence, the liberal argument, economic independence leads to peace, I think didn't hold out even at the, uh, the prelude of the First World War, right? I mean, that was the biggest sort of uh, uh, counter argument to globalization leads to peace. But I think there's some more interesting research that suggests that if, you, if states expect or have expectations of future interdependence and they expect growing ties between their businesses, people-to-people uh, -people contacts, uh, institutional contacts between the private sector, uh, expectations, that is not today, but they expect it to happen. Then you tend to see those states formulating policies that uh, encourage geopolitical stability and less likely to upset the conditions for economic engagement. So what I'm suggesting here is that uh, if in China, the belief took root that 
the expectations of future economic engagement with India are now diminishing because of this broader shift that's happening in the United States and India and in this the tech, uh, the dig digital technology sector uh, where we were reorienting, then it sort of uh, takes away any incentive for them to link up the two. And, and they went after just purely uh, geopolitical gains and focusing on their territorial interests. So, so I think that for me was uh, on, on this idea that should we have now future economic engagement with India? I think that that's too stark a, a binary to draw. I think the question should be asked is, what is the level of interdependence with China that is consistent with the goals that we have set for ourselves? And the goals we've set for ourselves is that we want Indian industry, Indian innovation to have at least be at a power, at, at, a, at a playing field. Um, it can never reach parity, but a playing field that it can engage with East Asia in a sense that you aren't just getting the crumbs of these international value chains, right? You want a little more value addition happening in India. So that's quite a legitimate aspiration to have. And I think that's where you can engage with the Japanese, the Chinese, the Europeans, and everyone else who has already been distributing capital and technology as it has been doing for the last 30, 40 years. So, so I think this is less about China, but about India having this industrial policy blueprint and then going out and globalizing, you know? So, so there's been a little bit of knee jerk where the discourse and the, uh, the policy is happening in sort of these, uh, these uh, silos. I think the first is if you are going to have your 2025 plan or let's call it a 2035 plan for the Indian economy, uh, a dozen sectors or half a dozen sectors, and then going out and saying that, okay, I see China really adding value on some areas, Jap Japan and others, the United States and others, Russia and something else. And then you sort of go out and build those. I think that's the way to go about rather than saying, I'm going to just cut out the Chinese and engage with everyone else because everyone else is already deeply engaged with the Chinese. So it's just not going to work. You're going to be the loser in that. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, now I'll turn to Dr. Sanjay Baru. Uh, Sanjay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kanta. Uh, Zohar, excellent. Well, thank you for your very interesting talk. I look forward to reading the book and to all your responses and Anand's comments. I have a question. In fact, it links to your very last statement about interdependencies and the problems that countries have with uh, the power shift. My question is very simple. There is a power shift uh, in China's favor within Asia in a bilateral uh, level between India and China, but also in general within Asia. The, the power shift to China. But this power shift is also happening at a global level, um, though not as starkly. My question is, since you in passing made a reference to the coming of the Biden administration and the likelihood of some change, would it not be correct to suggest that an improved US-China relationship presents as many challenges to India as deteriorating US-China relations? That US-China relationship, whether it improves from where it is now or worsens from where it is now, both pose challenges for India. Uh, is that a fair proposition or not? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bar. Absolutely. So I think, I think the big bet we made in the last five years is that strategic competition between the United States and China is now inevitable in a sense. And the type of China policies that are going to slowly be adopted by American administrations are gradually going to open up opportunities for India because they need other partners, they need other uh, states in Asia on China's periphery that they would like to strengthen to shape this balance of power. Uh, having said that, uh, if you have a, a, a US administration, and by the way, if the Biden administration adopts this, it will not be an aberration, but it will be more the norm in a sense. What we saw in the recent years was a, a, a massive internal struggle that was happening for where India's uh, where uh, U.S. foreign policy is heading, and 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 kind of sort of reorient towards Asia. So, if you're going to see uh, uh, the U.S. stabilize or certainly not unfold this, give give expression to strategic competition in the way we have imagined it to be, which is some sort of a uh, a, a major clash, not a violent clash, but real competition where cooperation is going to be right down of the list. You're going to see more and more issues where they're going to be at loggerheads. Interdependence is now going to sort of fizzle out. 
I think that was an uh, assumption that might not play out as we have sort of forecast. Uh, uh, the reason for that is uh, not just what the Biden administration does, but the, just the structural interdependence and the interlinkages that have already been created, not just between China and the United States, but between China and the international order. I think for that to, uh, uh, f- uh, to sort of roll those back will require such a vast mammoth task for the United States to lead not just the NATO alliance and its core allies in Asia, but a much wider coalition of states, which is simply not possible today. I mean, that's where the power shift, as you said, has already happened. So if you're dealing with a multipolar world, why would we be surprised if the United States does not slowly start acknowledging this multipolar world, right? And starts dealing with maybe Russia in a different fashion as it, it did uh, with China in the first Cold War, where, and it starts dealing with India in that, where it will say, okay, we may have some common ground with you on China on certain parts of China's influence, but not on, in a totality. So, but, you know, it may not be entirely to India's disadvantage because uh, the, the argument that was being put across in India is that be ready for this next superpower rivalry. You've got to make a hard swing to one side. And you, if you don't make that choice, you're going to lose out. I'm making the argument in this book, and I think many others also hold on, that multipolar world does not mean the old Cold War, where you're either one side or the other. You have middle space. You have space for agency. You have space to extract advantages for multiple powers because they simply aren't powerful enough to pull you into their orbits or push you to the other side. I mean, you look at the Ladakh crisis, right? We still didn't lose ourselves, right? We didn't, we didn't just fold up. There was still enough in the global system to give Chinese a measure of pause on that next step, right? Even though the power asymmetry favored them. So, so I think the argument to be made is that even an adjustment of the US-China strategic competition towards tentative cooperation or competitive coexistence, the the framework that I'm laying out for India and China might not be disadvantages because it might push us back or allow us to adopt what we had always believed was a far more stable foreign policy path where you maintain your civilizational identity, your geopolitical independence, and pursue your national interests with a multitude of partners, including engagement with China. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Yudhavar. Uh, Ravi, Ravi Bhutlingam, Ravi would like to ask a question now. Uh, thank you. Uh, Zoravar, uh, congratulations uh, on the book uh, and on your very lucid presentation. I look forward to uh, reading the book. Uh, thank you. My, my question uh, goes back to two phrases that you used. Uh, one is the power gap and the growing power gap between India and China. And the second is the uncertainty uh, about each other in terms of basic trust. So I would think that when there is such a situation to build trust, you you need a foundation of some sort of transactions of some sort, whether people to people, whether economic, whatever. So those platforms need to be available to uh, develop that. And going further, if you look at economics, not only do does economic engagement have that uh, foundation uh, uh, to at least hope for an increase uh, in transactions and thereby confidence, but I would suggest it's also instrumental in helping closing the power gap. So when India has taken these measures uh, to uh, to kind of act, restrict Chinese investments, uh, to uh, look at trade uh, with a very fine tooth comb, imposing duties and all manner of things and limit economic engagement. Uh, Has it not, have we not, as it were, inflicted a double whammy on ourselves in terms of ability, in terms of making closing of that power gap even more difficult in terms of differential in economic power and in providing a platform for engagement to build trust. After all, uh, Anand spoke about Japan and ASEAN 
and even Russia and even the United States uh, in the middle of so many different issues they have with China, they have kept economic engagement alive and kicking. Um, and while, as you say, economic engagement by itself may not guarantee peace, it at least provides a platform. So how would you come back to the issue of handling economic relations in a positive way to close the power gap while still maintaining the ambiguity uh, until such time as that power gap has ena enabled uh, the border situation and other issues to resolve themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. So maybe if I just summarize how I viewed it, I, I think the question that we need to ask ourselves, can we uh, do a policy on China, the way China used uh, uh, the United States during its period of rise, right? Like, can we do a dung shopping with China, basically? Can we leverage uh, uh, this major power that's out there to modernize ourselves without, during that process, losing uh, uh, and whittling away our domestic industry, everything? So, so the, the answer to that is, I think, quite straightforward. I think the problems really are at home, uh, your institutions, your higher educational institutions, uh, the type of uh, industrial blueprints or lack of across sectors that you have sort of placed out. So I think we're talking of a multitude of, of structural uh, problems and, and just the architecture of the Indian political economy is such that when you globalize, you end up sort of losing ground in a sense uh, faster than you would have a more, let's call it a state uh, driven capitalist system like the East Asian model, so to speak. So you're, you're already starting from a position that keeps you on the edge that if you, uh, I mean, even if you look at, let's say Chinese uh, geoeconomic policies for those three decades, you, you saw a lot of uh, intensive struggles domestically in terms of the SEOs, the private sectors, a conscious sort of state uh, attention given uh, on, on building up innovation while you were doing this intensive interdependence with Japan, Korea, the United States, Europe. So in our case, I think it's just that, that the absence of these domestic uh, sort of buffers uh, just complicate this process. Having said that, now we are a very different political economy uh, and I don't see that change happening anytime soon. So you're going to have to firstly lay out the sectors that you want to you feel are important for you from a political perspective, employment perspective, uh, and which are critical for you, which have sort of uh, across industry linkages, et cetera. And then you sort of uh, lay out that framework for economic cooperation. So I think, I don't think here, and then uh, uh, you try and sort of present a different framework. So I think maybe going back to uh, this, the, the vision that was laid out in 2014, this new developmental partnership I think it was just a slogan, really. It never really got expression on a major engagement with China where you truly say, okay, these are the opportunities out there. What can you do for us? Instead, we, okay, we did see, to be fair, in certain areas like uh, di the digital sector, the startup sector, there were areas where you saw quite a bit of Chinese investment that came up from 2015, 16 to 2018, 2019. Uh, but, but that was, again, not not sort of strategic driven as much as could have been where India says, this is what we have. Th these are your strengths. And this is, these are our strategic goals because this is precisely the way the Chinese engage with everyone else, right? They've already set out their goals. Uh, and, and they're saying that if you want access to a market, these are the uh, terms and these are the kinds of, uh, it ultimately leads to technology transfers, knowledge transfers, uh, uh, more strategic forms of FDI. Um, for me, the problem is really a domestic policy problem, really. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't give you a more profound answer than that, but uh, we need to emulate more on how the East Asians leverage globalization. I don't think we leverage globalization as good as or effectively as we can. And partly that could be with just the way our state capital relations are in India. I mean, big business, let's face it, does play a very important role in how the Indian economy evolves, unfolds. And, and, and their interests, of course, will never be what a national uh, power, comprehensive national power perspective, right? You, I mean, no big capital in India is interested in CNP. They're interested in uh, shareholder value, 
and market cap uh, and, and that business family growing right from generation to generation. So this is where the biggest difference with India and China lies. I mean, you've got massive billionaires there, but who's setting grand strategy? Thank you. Ambassador Kanta. We, we, we could have, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Okay. Sorry, I, I lost you for a second. Yeah. Yeah. We could have continued this discussion, but we have unfortunately run out of time now. So we'll have to bring this conversation to a close now. I will not try to summarize a very rich dialogue that we had this afternoon on uh, Joe Rauer's uh, new book, Power Shift, India-China Relations in a Multipolar World. Uh, it's a very important contribution to the existing literature on India-China relations. It's an insightful, timely, and readable book. And uh, I believe uh, you know, it will uh, trigger off uh, useful conversations on a whole lot of issues, including on, uh, on the boundary question, on how the broader geopolitical developments impact India-China relations, uh, on how India and China need to operate, engage in their shared periphery, both land and maritime, uh, the quest for new equilibrium, which is being talked about in India-China relations, a whole lot of other issues. Uh, Jorawar has given some uh, important uh, policy ideas uh, in his book, uh, which deserve, uh, you know, close attention, and I'm sure that will happen in, in weeks and months to come. So thank you very much, Jorawar, for writing this book and for agreeing to have this discussion this afternoon. Let me also thank you know, uh, Anand Krishnan for, for uh, making some very valuable remarks on uh, Jorawar's book, and all of you for ensuring that we had good conversation this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.